As a physicist, though, this isn't the rule, of course. I'm just going to assume, though, correct me if I'm wrong, that you believe in, in the reality of unobservables like electrons or quarks that are vital to our most successful theories, even if they might boil down to something else like strings. But how do you conceive of some of the numbers that go along with them? Are you someone who believes that they too have an objective existence of some sort, or maybe that they're just part of a, a language we use to describe and compare what we observe? And I imagine that having this mathematical background and the the physics expertise as well gives you an interesting perspective on the matter. Yeah, I mean, so, so you t you, it's nice that you talked about electrons, actually, in that context, because as soon as you do that, you know that you're going to need, when you write down our theory of electrons, um, it involves um, an imag imaginary numbers, right? So you write down a theory, you need, you need to use imaginary numbers to actually, uh, you know, write down the theory. And so... Of course, any upset, but what is an, is an imaginary number in any sense part of our physical world? Is, does that really make sense? Um, we certainly don't measure imaginary numbers in any sense, but but the, phys the thing we use to describe that theory of electrons does use them. So, I mean, I think it's a very deep question, and you know, it's, it's one really for the philosophers, and and you know, th there are many different ways you can think about it. You can think about sort of, you know, whether numbers. You know, they're obviously a man-made construction, but are they are they really part of the physical world, or are they separate from the physical world and just a tool for describing it? Um, and one of one of the things I, I always think is fascinating when you think about this is is the way, and this, this goes back to to Wigner's famous essay in the nineteen sixties where he talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of, of mathematics, and and you know, t so we have this universe. With all the wonderful things that happen in it, expansion of the universe, you know, neutron stars collapsing into into black holes, you know, wonderful, amazing physics, the, the microscopic physics that we can talk about, whether we're talking about particle physics or string theory or whatever, all, all but, the, but whatever, whatever we use to describe, but but ultimately there's stuff going on, right? And we're using mathematics to describe it, and mathematics does an incredible job of doing it, right? But we've got absolutely no right to expect it. To do that, because ultimately maths is a is is, is a man made construction, right? So, and yet it does this incredible job of describing the universe. Will it continue to do this incredible job uh, of describing the universe as we probe more and more deeply into the you know in, into the micro world? Um, I don't know, but it's it, it's 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 incredible that it has done. We, we've come up with this tool, this thing which we call maths, and yet. It's just done this fantastic, and it, with all its wonderful things like, like imaginary numbers and irrational numbers, and 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 all these things that really, you know, really hard to intuit in some sense. And yet they describe the world. It enables us to describe the world so wonderfully well. And I think that is fascinating. How long we can ride that for, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, one of the sort of great mysteries, and it's to be very philosophical, is, is in the nature. You know, what is quantum gravity? I would be a proponent of string theory, but, but you know maybe part of that question is understanding the true nature of infinity and 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 what is infinity, and of course that that touches on mathematics as well and and how to understand infinity in mathematics. So so it does is nature going to play ball there too? We, we don't know. It's still that you know that one of the great final frontiers of theoretical physics is what is the nature of of quantum gravity and all the infinities that arise there. How do we control them? So yeah. I, <laughs> I mean, the, the, the relationship between numbers and, and physics is, is, is one that's served us really well, but I don't know how long we, we, we can continue to, to rely upon it. Who knows? Hmm. Well, just to, uh, for me to clarify what you were saying, you, you used the word tool a number of times in describing mathematics. Can I take that as meaning that you don't epitomize the view uh, of a platonist per se, where we're not, we are inventing math. We're not really discovering it. Or maybe you think we are discovering it. We're, we're making discoveries about a universe of sets, but our description, the mathematical logic, the way we describe it is still a man-made construction. Yeah. I, I would say my views that it's man-made. I mean, I, I'm open-minded on this and I've seen, you know, things that, that people like, Tegmark have sort of speculated on this about the mathematical universe. 
um, you know, the, the idea that all things that are mathematical are kind of realized and they, they are part of this sort of greater multiverse. You know, I, I think within mathematics itself, there is, there are, it's not always clear that that's consistent. And, you know, we know from, you know, going deep into sort of Gödel's ideas about incompleteness that, that sometimes, you know, it's not clear that mathematics itself is, in, is, is always going to be self consistent, you know, ar- you know, arbitrarily. So, so I think for that reason, I'm inclined to think of maths as a, as a tool and a, and a man-made construction, which d- is really good for describing our universe, but how, but can we do that forever? I, I'm not convinced. And, and, you know, I, so, so it's, it's a really, it's a really interesting point actually, because, because the, I guess this is where the physicist comes in, right? This is where, so, so one of the things that, that, um, that you can think about is, you know, what, it, how, how do we define our theories in physics? How do we, how do we, how do we build our theories? Well, on some level, we have two. We have two things that we can use. On the one hand, we have, you know, mathematics, and there's the consistency of the mathematical model, and that it makes sense, and that ever, there's no internal inconsistencies that the mathematics can show. That's really important and a really powerful tool. It's really good. But the other tool that we have is, of course, experiments. And at the end of the day, experiment always wins. It will always win, and it's it's as somebody with a math background, it's sometimes hard to re- remind yourself of that. But it, but it's ultimately true. Experiments is always the winner because you 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 go with what you see. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't question the experiment sometimes, and, and that's happened in the past. And uh, where experiment doesn't seem to really make sense, and then of course, you, you know, there's there's found to be issues with the experiment themselves. But but that's to say that ultimately, experiment is ultimate arbit- arbitrary, and we must always remember that. But that doesn't mean at the same time that we can't use maths as a, as a way to guide us because I think we can and, and and we do and we have and that's that's one of the themes of the book actually. Yes, you you mentioned Max Tegmark a few minutes ago and that's actually where I wanted to start our journey into the this bestiary of numbers. But before that, I, I an episode came out yesterday with Andy Strominger on on string theory and. I just wanted to go back to something you said even earlier, which is so that understanding infinity is particularly important for string theory. And I was wondering why it comes up there rather than with just quantum theory or just general relativity. Why, why does, why is infinity so particularly important for string theory? Well, I wouldn't necessarily mean for string theory. I meant the problem of quantum gravity. So, so the, the, the reason is, is that, so we have this, when we try to sort of um, study the quantum corrections, to, so, so let's take let's take uh, the electro- electromagnetism, and, you know, quantum electrodynamics. You know, when we consider the sort of quantum corrections to the theory of, of an electron and a photon, you know, we we we, we actually find infinities that appear. Okay, so the, then this is actually this is Oppenheimer. You know, the Oppenheimer. So it was a very topical at the moment. It was it was Oppenheimer who was working on a calculation. Uh, you know, sort of suggested to him by Pauli, uh, where he was trying to calculate the spectral lines of, of hydrogen, and uh, and the quantum corrections to the, to that in this new quantum theories that you know, quantum field theories that, that we were using, and what he showed was is that there is an, the, the answer you get is getting infinite answers, and so th- these infinities are appearing even in quantum electrodynamics. But what what you find is is there's a way to handle them. And it's a process which we call renormalization, where it, essentially, and this is a bit of a loose way to say it, but essentially what you do is you you, you, you take that infinity and you you kind of sweep it under the rug, as, as five would put it, right? You know, you, you literally cancel it off with another infinity. It's the kind of thing that turns mathematicians' blood, blood cold, right? But it kind of works. And when you do this in a consistent way, what you find is is that ultimately, in the case of QED, uh, you just... You just have to do this for the ele- mass of the electron and the charge of the electron, and then all other observables that are related to them, you know, now fall into place, and you can make concrete predictions and come up with a, with a predictive theory. And there are only two quantities that you have to sort of do a sleight of hand with, and it all works beautifully. And so that allows you to sort of make experimental predictions because you do your sleight of hand twice: once for the mass, once for the once for the charge, and then all these other experimental predictions fall into place, and you can test them. Now the problem is when you try to do this with gravity. So in other words, when you're trying to do quantum gravity, there isn't just two things that you have to sort of do the sleight of hand with. Actually, 
there are an infinite number of things. So, so it, what happens is in quantum gravity, there are an infinite number of infinities. Okay, so there's an infinite number of times you have to do this sweeping under the carpet, this sleight of hand that, that worked really so well with QED. And so that's not a predictive theory. That's that's just not something you can work with. And so this is what what I meant by saying you've got to try and control the infinity. So so it, what happens with quantum gravity is is that just infinity after infinity after infinity just comes popping out of the quantum correction to the theory. And it just gets worse and worse and worse. So the one thing you can do is you can cut the theory off. You can say, I'm not going to trust the theory beyond um, some very high energy scale. Typically, you take that to be the Planck scale. And just say, if I don't even try to go any higher than that, and that kind of resolves the infinity, but it also restricts the regime of applicability of your theory. And in a case of, you know, if you're veering near a black hole singularity, your theory is going to break down. Right. So, 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 so you want to be able to do quantum gravity. You want to be able to push the theory up to arbitrary high energies, just as you were able to do QED. And well, unfortunately at this stage that, that naively requires you to have this infinite number of infinities. String theory, on the other hand, is, is kind of gets around these problems by giving extent, giving and give, introducing a natural scale, which is the, you know, the string scale, which, which kind of sort of smooths everything out in a really elegant way. But that's what I meant by by sort of the problem of quantum gravity is is perhaps in some sense related to the problem of infinities and understanding the nature of infinity. Or not. I mean, we don't know. 